J.R. Pepper here, and we're up to week probably higher than there are James Bond revivals of the New York Quarantine. And I'm here to teach you some art historical smut. The best way to start this off is with a quote from one of my favorite art historians and surrealist scholars, Whitney Chadwick. You can tell how often I refer to this book and read this book as a result of the dog tags. Art historical slash archival rant, don't do what I did here, because the acidity just destroys the books. Just, it's a pet peeve, but I use it so, it, I'm not going to explain anything to the internet. But anyway. What the hell was that? The best way to start this talk is with a quote which is, no artistic movement since Romanticism has elevated the image of woman to as significant a role in the creative life of man as Surrealism did. No group or movement has had such a large number of active women participants. Yet the actual role or roles played by women artists in the Surrealist movement has been more difficult to evaluate for their own histories have often remained buried under those male Surrealists who have gained wider public recognition. Max Dernst is recognized as one of the creators and founders of not one but two movements in the history of art, that of Dada and later that of Surrealism. He is also considered by many to be one of the most important and influential artists in the history of art. He is mainly known for his paintings, but he was also a sculptor, collage artist, and poet. Many of Max's pieces were known for their use of experimentation in the medium, for example this piece entitled Two Children Threatened by a Nightingale, in which the sculptural pieces break free from the canvas and even break free of the frame to extend the narrative. Another example is this piece entitled The Robing of the Bride, which shows us the chief iconography of Max Ernst, that of birds and bird-like creatures, and incidentally also boobage. Max had an extensive history with women, and by extensive history I mean uh, about as lengthy as a uh, Game of Thrones book, more or less. Uh, he was also as inspired and beguiled by them, and he was also practically obsessed with them. A large variety of his catalog of works has something to do with women in the title. Don't believe me? I've got a list. And we've got all your favorites, including Woman Reveling, The Equivocal Woman, The Wavering Woman, The Wizard Woman, The Tottering Woman, The Word, Robbing of the Bride, Eve, The Only One Left to Us, Max Ernst Showing a Young Girl the Head of His Father, The Painter's Daughter, Woman, Old Man, Flower Femme, The Virgin Spanking, A Maiden, Widow, and a Wife, Return of the Beautiful Gardener, Commonplaces, Girls, Death, and the Devil, Saint Cecilia, The Bride of the Wind, The Beautiful German Girls, Lop Lop Presents a Young Girl, and She Slightly Resembles a Horse. And my personal favorite, The Hundred Headless Women, which is as absurd as it is insulting, incredibly sexist, and fetishizing. But even Shakespeare would have to admit. Good title. Mm. So yeah, it's pretty clear that he was obsessed with women, or the ideas of women, or what women might have represented, and it's all over his artwork, in every way, shape, or form. It's important to note that Ernst wasn't the only one that saw women this way during the Surrealist movement. Uh, they were literal furniture as we've seen before, and in some cases just dilapidated dolls that are just used for their sex parts, like in the case of Hans Bellmer. But Max, you can clearly see a correlation between his actual treatment of women in his life and his work. Uh, the ass hattery should be included in the understanding of who the man is as an artist, as well as the person that he would set out to be. So often we get these art catalogs, and they go on at great length to describe how Picasso was a genius, how Ernst was a genius, and a variety of controversial and um, <clears throat> damning figures in film, and I'll use that term loosely so I don't get written up, but uh, the idea of the powerful creative man and the destruction that they've left behind is not uncommon, and it's important to note that many of these people that we hold in high accolades were... Quite frankly. His history is so extensive and complicated that I felt the need to make a diagram chart of his relationships and liaisons. Here it is. Max's relationship history is complicated, to say the least. He was married multiple times, but he's also known for many long-term relationships that never panned out exactly the way anybody had planned. But the problem is, is that so often, these would blend into each other. He would be pining for one while sleeping with the other, or marrying the other, or he 
wouldn't let the previous partner know that the relationship had ended at all. There are entire books about this. Max Ernst was born on April 2nd, 1891 and died April 1st, 1976. He was born in Germany and raised in a strict Catholic household. Surprisingly enough, he had no formal artistic training and although he did attend university, he always tended to travel towards the arts. Like many of the artists we have spoken so far, he was a man of many talents, including writing, painting, poetry, collage, etchings, design, and sculpture. He dabbled in pretty much everything, actually. And that includes his many, many, many relationships. Max had many important relationships, but he was married four times. To Lou, to Mary Beth, Dorothea Tanning, and of course, famed New York socialite Peggy Guggenheim. Max's first wife was Louise Strauss, also known as Lou. They got married in 1914 and would remain married until 1927. Lou was a successful art historian and writer. In fact, she was the first woman to get a PhD in art history from the University of Bonn. In 1920, they had their son, named Ulrich Jimmy Ernst. With World War II on the horizon, Lou fled to France to escape the National Socialists, but unfortunately, like so many, she was arrested. And despite Jimmy and Max's multiple attempts to get her to leave and to get her out of Europe, she would die in Auschwitz in 1944. Not long after the birth of his son, Ernst would start to kind of shy away from the marriage, and in 1921 he meets Paul Ellard. Subsequently, that following year, Max would enter into a polyamorous relationship with Paul and his wife, the insatiable Gala. At which point Max would leave his wife and son behind. Ernst wasn't just involved with Gala, this three-way relationship between Max, Paul, and Gala went on for quite some time. It's rumored Gala had an insane libido, so it's possible that the men were together merely to please her. However, what is clear is that Paul and Max had a very strong relationship, and especially a strong creative relationship. Here's a photo of the three of them on skis, which I will show at any and all opportunity that I absolutely can, because I find it hysterical. Max and Paul would collaborate on several projects, including one in March of 1922, publication called Repetition, which was a collection of Paul's poems and Ernst's collages. The close relationship between Max and the Ellards would turn into a bit of a love triangle. Paul once said, I love Max Ernst much more than Gala does. But it does seem that Max was very smitten with her at the time. The three-way menage a trois went on, as I mentioned, for quite a bit of time. But as these things tend to do, it ended, ended, ended badly. Oh, why can't couples that start out cheating ever end up happy? One day, Jimmy had run into Gala, and she had invited him to lunch. Jimmy stood up and walked out of the restaurant, which infuriated her beyond belief, and this was an event that she would bring up for years later. When Jimmy told Max about it, Max had this to say. You are learning, but not fast enough. I had no hand in your upbringing, which is probably just as well. Under my tutelage, you could have saved yourself a whole valuable day in your life. She has become a parody of a woman, he means Gala. And he resembles those horrid jellies that Americans eat for dessert. Dali. Stay away from Spanish olives and Russian vodka. Even though it was supposed to be a three-way polyamorous relationship, it's pretty clear that Max had sincere feelings for Gala. He was in love, or at least in lust, with her, as evidenced in the 1924 piece which Max shows at the Salon des Indépendants, entitled The Beautiful Gardener slash The Creation of Eve. The piece clearly shows a nude gala with her genital region blocked by <clears throat> a bird. The work seemed to many that Ernst was basically flaunting the cuckolding relationship. It should be noted that birds were kind of a thing for Max to Ernst. Not only did birds and bird-like anthropomorphic people appear regularly in many of his works as a sort of symbolic chimera, specifically Ernst would use them as his own alter ego of sorts. So having a bird hiding at Gala's genitals is kind of a big middle finger to Paul. Paul also related them to his own personal alter ego, specifically one creature he called Lop Lop. When asked multiple times what Lop Lop was in reference to, he was pretty cheeky and just kind of let art historians and scholars try to figure it out on their own. 
The truth is the bird superior that represented Max Ernst, aka Lop Lop, the name came from the name of the rocking horse that he had given his son Jimmy, and the noise that it made. Isn't that sweet? Then one night in 1924, Paul would simply disappear, and he claimed to mutual friends that his life he found generally torturous. He left first for Monaco and then for Saigon. He asked for his wife to join, and Max Ernst also followed. Max had to sell some paintings in order to finance the damn trip nearly halfway around the world. After a brief time together in Saigon, the couple would stay together. Max, however, would return without them. Paul and Gala would remain married until 1929, when she seduced and later married the owner of one of the most notorious mustaches of all time, Salvador Dali. When asked later why the relationship didn't work with Gala, Max would reply, she wouldn't let me paint. But have no fear, art smut lovers, because Max Ernst would get married again in 1927, this time to a woman named Marie, who was overly religious, which is weird considering he made a painting with the Virgin Mary spanking the baby Jesus while he watched. Tune in next time for Art Historical Smut, where we'll learn all about the debacles and liaisons of Max Ernst a little bit more. Apologies for the two parts, this has been draining as hell because I've also been watching a ridiculous amount of True Blood for some reason, and I can't really understand why. Tune in next time for part two of Art Historical Smut Presents There's Something About Max or How to Be a Talented Jerk, where we'll learn about his relationship with a sex addict and New York debutante, the love of his life, a trip out to Sedona, as well as a sexy, surrealist tea party. In the meantime, I'm J.R. Pepper at GirlDuality.com. Stay safe, wash your hands, and may all your wine be tasty. And no group or movement has ever defined such a revolution. Words. It's hard when it's hot in your apartment and you've been furloughed from your job. They're hard. Revolutionary role for her. <laughs>